We're continuing this series on what is Satan, who is Satan, and we're doing this for the purpose of understanding how do we fight this battle. In this video, we're going to take a look at spirit. Now, there are evil spirits and there are good spirits. So we're just going to simply take a look at spirit, and then uh, next we'll take a look at evil. The word for spirit is ruach. It's a Hebrew word, H7307. Let's see how God used it in a sentence. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And they heard the voice of the Lord, God walking in the garden of, in the cool, cool is the context here. That's interesting. The cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid, in, hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath, breath is the context of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. And they went in unto Noah and the ark, and two, and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. Breath is the context. All in whose nostrils was the breath of life of all that was in the dry land died. Okay, so what gives you life? It's the breath it's the spirit not the brain not the flesh that's being measured by science it's the spirit even though they try to create life in petri dishes and all these other things spirit is what gives you life and god remembered noah and every living thing and the cattle that was with him in the ark and god made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuaged okay so thus far we have spirit breath wind which were of grief of mind now we have mind unto isaac and to rebecca and it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told to them his dream. But there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such one as this is a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons, which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father revived. And Moses spake unto the children of Israel, but they hearkened not unto Moses for anguish of spirit and for cruel bondage. Okay, so there's feelings in the spirit and there's also thoughts in the spirit or associated with the spirit. And Moses stretched forth his rod over the land of Egypt and the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. So wind is also spirit. And the Lord turned a mighty strong west wind, which took away the locusts and cast them into the Red Sea. There remained not one locust in all the coasts of Egypt. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. So that's interesting. It's spirit that actually drove this back, right? Wind. And with the blast, blast is the context of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together, the floods stood upright as an heap and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea thou didst blow thy wind the the sea covered them they sank as lead in the mighty waters and thou shalt speak unto the all that are wise-hearted whom i have filled with the spirit of wisdom that they may make aaron's garments to consecrate him that he may minister unto me in the priest's office Okay, so there's a spirit of something, of wisdom, of dizziness, of joy. So there are thoughts, and there are emotions, and there are characteristics that go along with spirit. And this is starting to build up the makeup of the soul. That word nefesh, which contains imaginations and thoughts and feelings and the heart, that is the soul. And I have filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship. And they came, every one, of the, uh, every one whose heart stirred him up, and every one whom his spirit made willing. And they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation, and for all his service and for the holy garments. Okay, so his spirit made willing. So this also reminds me that God is the one who turns hearts. So his spirit is what makes willing. This also reminds me of what Jesus said when the, when the disciples were falling asleep and he was telling them, pray, pray that you're not going to be tempted. And he said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The spirit that's in you, and I'm not, necessarily, I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about the spirit that God gave you is willing because it comes from God. 
the flesh is fighting against the will of God. And so the spirit that's in you is willing. And then you have the spirit of God that's in you. And those sp- the, your spirit that's in you is communicating with the spirit of God because he is spirit. That's where you need to live. You, you cannot live in the flesh and possibly please God. You cannot live in the, in the flesh and possibly be willing to do the things of God. And the spirit of jealousy came upon him and he be jealous of his wife and she be defiled. Or if the spirit of jealousy come upon him and he be jealous of his wife and she not be defiled. So now he's talking about this um, curse of bitter water if a wife had been unfaithful. The point is that he's talking about a spirit of jealousy. So there are characteristics and there are emotions that go along with that spirit. And I will come down and talk with thee there, and I will take the spirit which is upon thee, and will put it upon them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not thyself alone. And the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto him, and took of the spirit that was upon him, and gave it unto the seventy elders, and it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. Okay, so now this is the spirit of God causing them to prophesy. But there remained two of the men in the camp, The name of the one was Eldad, and the name of the other, Medad, and the spirit rested upon them, and they were of them that were written, and went not out unto the tabernacle, and they prophesied in the camp. And Moses said unto them, Envious thou for my sake, would God that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. And there went forth a wind from the Lord, and brought quails from the sea, and let them fall by the camp, as it were a day's journey on on this side. And as it were a day's journey on the other side, round about the camp, and as it were two cubits high upon the face of the earth. Okay, so his spirit, or the wind that he sets forth, is bringing quails from the sea and letting them fall by the camp. So he is doing things by his spirit, causing things to come to pass. Whether it's parting the sea, whether it's closing up the sea on the enemies of God, whether it's bringing quail, by his spirit, by his wind, by his power, he is accomplishing these things. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him and hath followed me fully, him I will bring into the land wherein to he went and his seed shall possess him. And they fell upon their faces and said, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin and wilt thou be wroth with all the congregation? Okay, so now we're talking about the God of all spirits. The God of the spirits and and the God of all spirits, really. What does that mean? That all spirits are subject to God. I don't care if that's an evil spirit or a good spirit. They are all subject to him. And Balaam lifted up his eyes and he saw Israel abiding in his tents according to their tribes and the spirit of God came upon him. Let the Lord, the God of spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation. And the Lord said unto Moses, take thee Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit and lay thine hands upon him. Okay, so anytime it's talking about the spirit, obviously it's talking about God. But Sion, king of Heshbon, would not let us pass by him. For the Lord thy God hardened his spirit and made him his heart obstinate, that he might deliver him into thy hand as appeareth this day. Okay, so when it's talking about his spirit, a person's spirit, it's the spirit that's inside them. It's not necessarily, it's not the spirit of God, it's the spirit that, has been placed inside of him. Now he says hardened his spirit. And usually the way we see this is that God hardens hearts, not a spirit, right? But you have to understand that in this, in the concept of nefesh, of the soul, all of these things go together. They're not distinct. They're not the way that, you know, the world tries to pull everything apart and make them as distinct entities so that they can study them and dissect them and everything else, right? So even in medicine, you see this tactic of the, of the devil where he, uh, the body is different from the mind. You go to a medical doctor for the body. You go to a psychological doctor for the mind. And even within that, there's the breaking down. Oh, this psychologist has a specialty in neurocognition. This psychologist has a specialty in trauma. And you break it down even further as though nothing has to do with each other. And then in medicine, you go to a doctor for the liver, you go to a doctor for your bones, you go to a doctor for, I mean, there's all kinds of broken down specialties. So now you don't even have a concept of the entire picture and you've completely eliminated all of this concrete, everything that's in the the natural and is carnal from the spiritual. 
Well, it's not so in the actual truth. In the actual truth, all of these things have to do with each other. So that when you have a physical ailment, a physical affliction, a mental affliction, an emotional affliction, everything is going to go back to the spiritual. The soul is not some separate part of you. The soul is contained in mind, body, spirit, heart. But what you have to understand is that that soul is being pulled toward evil all the time in the world and in the flesh. And God is trying to get you to conform to him, but he's not pulling you. He's not coercing you. He's moving you. He's disciplining you. He's molding you and you have to receive it. You have to receive it. You have to recognize it and you got to turn to him. And Joshua son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom for Moses had laid his hands upon him and the children of Israel hearkened unto him and did as the Lord commanded Moses. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did they remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God of heaven, in heaven above and in earth beneath. Courage is actually the context right there. We kind of use this, right? We, we say uh, uh, that you, have, you really have a uh, spirit in you or what a strong spirit you have. And it came to pass when all the kings of the Amorites, which were on the side of Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan from before the children of Israel until we were passed over, that their heart melted, neither was their spirit in, any, in them anymore because of the children of Israel. The word also in some translations is they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. So we talk about that, this as well when we talk about a person losing spirit. And the spirit of the Lord came upon him. And he judged Israel and went out to war, and the Lord delivered, oh my goodness, this name, Shushan Rithathiam, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed against, oh, I'm not even going to say it again. <laughs> I, I think I did good the first time. That guy. But the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, and Abiezer was gathered after him. God hath delivered into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb, and Zeb, and what was I able to do in comparison of you? Then their anger was abated toward him. Anger is the context right there. Was abated toward him when he had said that. Okay, in the NIV version, it says, at this, their resentment against him subsided. So both contexts are still this word, spirit, or this concept of spirit. So we should be thinking about that as different emotions are rising, that this is very much associated with this concept of spirit. Then God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Shechem, and the men of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech. Then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed over Gilead and Manasseh, and passed over Mitzvah of Gilead, and from Mitzvah of Gilead he passed over unto the children of Ammon. And the spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtal. And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he rent him as he would have rent a kid. And he had nothing in his hand, and he told not his father nor his mother what he had done. Okay, I'm going to look at the NIV because that was a little difficult to understand. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn a young goat. But he told neither his father nor his mother what he had done. Okay, I get it now. <laughs> and the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon and slew 30 men of them, and took their spoil, and gave change of garments unto them, which he expounded which expounded the riddle and his anger was kindled and he went up to his father's house. And when he came to Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him and the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him and the cords that were upon his arms became as flax that was burnt with fire and his bands loosed from off his hands. Okay. So the spirit of the Lord gives you power, but God clave and hollow place that was in the jaw and there came water there out. And when he had drunk, his spirit came again and he revived Wherefore he called the name thereof Enhakor, which is in Lehi unto this day. Okay, so in the NIV context, it says that when Samson, Samson drank, his strength returned and he revived. But there's an association of strength with spirit. That's important for us to remember, to stay strong in spirit. And Hannah answered and said, No, my lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink and have poured out my soul before the Lord. So again, we see that association with feelings, emotions, and spirit, and how those emotions affect your spirit. 
even to the point that you would identify a spirit as being sorrowful. And the spirit of the Lord will come upon thee and thou shalt prophesy with them and shalt be turned into another man. NIV says the spirit of the Lord will come powerfully on you and you will prophesy with them and you will be changed into a different person. And when they came hither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him and the spirit of God came upon him and he prophesied among them. Ooh, this is going to be a long video. There's a lot of context. And the spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard those tidings and his anger was kindled greatly. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servants said unto him, Behold, now an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Okay, so we're diverging now to understanding that there is a spirit that can occupy you, that can trouble you. This is different from the spirit of God, and this is different from the spirit he's placed in you. This is a spirit that is occupying you. And in fact, what the word says is that the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and then an evil spirit came in. And Jesus described this. He talked about what happens when a spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places looking for rest and doesn't find it, then it comes back, and when it finds that house swept clean, but it's unoccupied meaning that it is not occupied by the spirit of God. So you're not fanning into flame. You haven't returned to God. It will bring with it seven more spirits, more wicked than itself. And the final condition of that person will be worse than it was in the beginning. And, and Jesus said, so it will be with this wicked generation. He did not say, so I'll send you medicine and they'll, and they'll tell you a different story about what's going on. No, this is what's going on with this generation. You need to know. And Saul's servant said unto him, behold, now an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Let our Lord, our Lord now command thy servants, which are before thee, to seek out a man who is a cunning player on a harp. And it shall come to pass, when the evil spirit from God is upon thee, that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. And it came to pass, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took an harp and played with his hand, so Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Now I want you to listen to this. This comes from uh, 1 Samuel 18, and I'm going to start at verse 5. Whatever mission Saul sent him on, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all the troops and Saul's officers as well. When the men were returning home from home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with timbrels and lyres. As they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. The next day, an evil spirit from God came forcefully on Saul. He was prophesying in his house while David was playing the lyre as he usually did. Saul had a spear in his hand, and he hurled it, saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. Do you notice that Saul was prophesying while he had an evil spirit? I can't remember if I said it in this video or in a previous video that evil spirits can know certain things. Those spirits that were associated with legion, that were in this legion of spirits, were saying to Jesus, you're the son of God. Have you come to throw us into the, the abyss, to send us to the abyss. That spirit that was in that girl who was sort of harassing Paul when Paul got annoyed with her and cast the spirit out of her. These are men of God. That spirit knew that. And so those spirits can be really messy and just compelled and they can know things, but they don't know all things. I'm sure you've heard of people talking about, oh, my my sister or so-and-so went to this psychic and they told them this and then this happened, or you've heard stories like that. So it's possible they can know things, but you are not to turn to them. In fact, the word says that you will be destroyed if you do. So people might be saying things on YouTube. They might even be right about certain things, but you are not to consult with anybody who is not of God, which means that you need to discern whether they're of God. Which means that if you're listening to my channel, you should be discerning whether I'm of God or not. And you shouldn't just be saying, well, let's see if the things that Carrie has said are going to take place. No, oh, it looks like they're being fulfilled, so she must be of God. That shouldn't be the, the only basis by which you discern me. You need to go to God and you need to ask him, it, not only if 
what I'm saying are, is going to happen is true. Because frankly, if you wait that long to discern it, you're not even hearing the warning that I'm speaking, that you need to, I'm not speaking this message in order for you to know what's going to happen in the future. I'm warning you about what's going to happen in the future. If you wait until that happens, you won't make it. What'll be the point? Just to look back and say, oh, Carrie was right. Now here I go to hell. That's not the message I'm speaking. You need to go to God and you need to discern whether what I say is true and if I'm from him. Saul knew certain things. Saul was prophesying even with an evil spirit in him. Prophecy is not a psychic reading. Prophecy means that you have certain understanding and that's what you're speaking. You have certain understanding about what's being fulfilled and what is going to come to pass. And usually when God's prophets, his actual prophets are prophesying, they're speaking a message you don't want to hear of warning and calling you back in. And the reason they're speaking that message is because God's people have turned away and they're not listening to him. Now let's contrast this with the gift of prophecy because Paul talks about the gift of prophecy. Now, does Saul have the gift of prophecy? No. Saul knows certain things, and so he is prophesying what's going to happen in sort of a spirit of, I mean, this is coming from an evil spirit, and it's sort of a spirit, I mean, he's he's a little paranoid, he's angry, he's hateful and murderous, he wants to kill David, so he understands what's coming down the pike, he can see the signs, he's able to see. You see in the word that God talks about seers, people who are able to see what is coming down the pike. And in Isaiah, the wicked people are saying to the seers, see no more visions. Give us no more visions of what is right. Tell us pleasant things, prophesy illusions. But they can't, the the prophets, the seers, see what's going to happen and the people don't wanna hear it. Saul does not have that gift. He's seeing something, but he doesn't have the gift of prophecy. And Saul sent messengers to take David, and when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying and Samuel standing as appointed over them, the Spirit of God was upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. And when it was told Saul, he sent other messengers, and they prophesied likewise. And Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they prophesied also. Then he went also to Ramah and came to a great wall that is in Saku. And he asked and said, Where are Samuel and David? And one said, Behold, they be at Nioth in Ramah. And he went thither to Nioth in Ramah, and the Spirit of God was upon him. And he went on and prophesied until he came to Nioth in Ramah. And he stripped off his clothes and prophesied before Samuel in like manner and lay down naked all that day and all that night. Wherefore they say, Is Saul also among the prophets? And they gave him a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit came again to him. And he had eaten no bread nor drunk any water three days and three nights. Okay, so that's just restoring strength. And he rode upon a cherub and did fly, and he was seen upon the wings of the wind. Wind is the context. And the channels of the sea appeared, the foundations of the world were discovered, and the rebuking of the Lord at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. Breath, again. I'm going to comb through this a minute and just see if there's anything that tells us a little bit more about these other spirits. Because there's a lot about the spirit of the Lord, and we were... The purpose of this video is to help us to understand a spirit that is occupying you. And what does that have to do with Satan? Okay, so here, 1 Kings twenty two twenty, And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner, and another said on, on that matter. And there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. Okay, so here is the context of a lying spirit. A lot of those on YouTube. You better discern. Verse 23. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these lot of all the, these thy prophets. And the Lord has spoken evil concerning thee. But Zedekiah, the son of Shenanah, went near and smote Micaiah on the cheek and said, which way went the spirit of the Lord from me to speak unto thee? Second Kings nineteen seven. behold, I will send a blast upon him and he shall hear a rumor and shall return to his own land and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. Blast is the context. In NIV, I'm going to read the NIV because it's a little bit, sometimes the language is just confusing in King James. Uh, verse five, when King Hezekiah's officials came to Isaiah, Isaiah said to them, tell your master, This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid of what you've heard. 
those words with which the underlings of the king, is, uh, king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Listen, when he hears a certain report, so this is that context of blast. When he hears a certain report, I will make him want to return to his own country, and there I will have him cut down with the sword. So there's this sort of blast or this wind or this, this uh, message that God is sending by that wind. So what I'm seeing here is that there can, there can be a spirit, the spirit of God, which, you know, it fills you. And there can also be a spirit of evil that is filling you that is sent by God, by the way. It can be a lying spirit, prophesying lies, even in the name of God. Plenty of those on YouTube. Plenty of those in counterfeit Christianity. Sent to entice. Remember that the word says that he will entice certain prophets to speak a certain word. And it's, he's presenting it as a stumbling block to those who continue to consult those prophets, to who continue to consult what their itching ears want to hear. They don't want to hear the message of God's prophets. All right, he'll give them others. And he will send a delusion that deceives all those who are perishing because of the way that wickedness deceives all those who are perishing, because that's what their feet make haste to run to. Okay, now let's... I, I, this is going to uh, speak more to the spirit of the Lord, but I, I just want to be able to take this so that we can understand the counterfeit. In Ezra 1, it, at 1, 1, it says, Now in the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying... Okay, so then King Cyrus is making sure that everyone has the funding for, for the temple. But I want you to see that he's stirring up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. And then in verse 5, five it says, Then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites with all them whose spirit God had raised to go up to build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. What I want to point out to you is that God is stirring up their spirit in order to accomplish his word. And the same thing is happening in those who are evil. He stirs up their spirit to do certain things. We have that happening in politics right now. If you don't speak on the authority of politics and you look at it from the perspective of what God is accomplishing at this time in history, then you will understand that he is stirring up certain spirits to fulfill his word. There is an antichrist kingdom that is going to rise in 2025 under a particular spirit. Not that not that a human being is the antichrist because the antichrist is a kingdom. But that kingdom is going to rise because of the spirit that he is stirring up in a particular individual. And that will be the year that the witnesses die when the Antichrist system, kingdom, rises to power. And it probably isn't who you think it is. It certainly isn't who you're being told in counterfeit Christianity is the devil. Because counterfeit Christianity is worshipping this person. Worshipping him. We were never supposed to want a human king. Why are human kings being taught at the pulpit? Preached campaigned for. Why is that happening? Because those so-called churches are of the devil. They lead you to gods that your ancestors have not known. Counterfeit Christianity is the Antichrist kingdom. That is what's going to rise. There's only one candidate right now who promotes it, even supporting Israel and their genocide of Palestinians. I don't care what you think of Palestinians or Muslims. That is not what God has told us to do. A nation in the Middle East is not Israel. It's not the spiritual Israel that is talked about in the New Testament. Not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Not all who are descended from Abraham are Abraham's children. A Jew is not one who is out, one outwardly, but one who is one inwardly through circumcision of the heart. You cannot reduce what God has established to an ethnicity. He established an ethnicity in order to help you to understand later on what spiritual Israel, spiritual Jews, spiritual children of Abraham are. But what is rising to power right now is that counterfeit antichrist kingdom. And they will indeed be given power. They will be given power. But you need to know what the word says. Not what Fox News says, not what anybody, any of the media, social media. It doesn't matter what human beings say. The only thing that matters is what God has said. What rose in the last couple years or few years with the left insanity, and certainly that's of the devil, certainly that's insanity. 
but it rose in order to expose the hypocrisy of the so-called religious right, who don't even know the word and are literally campaigning for the Antichrist, for a combination of church and state. Stupidity. And I'm not telling you how to vote. I'm not even telling you to vote. I don't vote because I, my hope is not in a human king. God will accomplish this. He doesn't need your vote. So just as God stirs up good spirits, he also stirs up bad spirits in order to accomplish his will. He also hands you over to bad spirits, just like he did with King Saul. We just read about it. It, I don't, it doesn't really matter if you like that idea. It's the truth. He is accomplishing his will. And part of the reason he's stirring up those spirits is because he's handing over certain people who've been claiming to be in him, he's handing them over to those spirits, to that judgment, to that punishment. As is written in Nehemiah 9.20, he says, Thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them, and withheldest not thy manna from their mouth, and gavest them water for their thirst. So he gives you good things, but if you choose the bad things, then he's a respecter of choice. He'll hand you over to them. Yet many years didst thou forbear them, and testifiest against them by thy spirit, in thy prophets. In thy prophets. So this is God testifying against the disobedient by his spirit in his prophets. Yet would they not give ear, therefore gavest thou them into the hands of the people of the lands. Okay, do you understand what he's saying right there? Yet many years didst thou forbear them and testifiest, good grief, these words in the, New King, in the King James, testified against them by thy spirit in thy prophets, Yet would they not give ear. Therefore, gavest thou into the hand of the people of the lands. So he's, he will hand you over if you're not listening to him. And also, he's testifying against people through his prophets. Does that mean the people are going to be like, and now what does God want to speak against us? And now what does he want to say against us? subscribe. Oh my goodness. Have you heard of this prophet who tells us what we don't want to hear? Oh, you got to subscribe to their channel. Is that how that goes? Or are they accused? Are they hated? Are they despised? Are they killed? And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness that smote the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young men and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Again, that wind is representing the power of God, what is being accomplished by the Spirit of God. By the blast of God, they perish, and by the breath of, God, of his nostrils are they consumed. Here in Psalm 104.4, it says, Who maketh his angels spirits, his ministers a flaming fire. Okay, there's no apostrophe there, so it's not like he, the, he's making the spirits of the angels, but makes his angels into spirits. So there are a lot of ideas about the difference between angels and spirits, it seems to be that they're the same. And I think the reason why God is using different language for angels and spirits is because he's demonstrating a different aspect of angelos, the word angelos in Greek, versus this word of ruach in Hebrew. The previous video was on angelos. This, vi this video is on ruach. In this video, we're talking more about this spirit as being one, a spirit that comes from God. Two, a spirit that is evil, that you're handed over to, that inhabits you. And three, a spirit that has been placed in you in order to enable you to do the will of God while you're in this condition. A spirit that comes from him that is willing, but the flesh is weak. In the previous video, when we talked about angelos, we talked about messenger, one that is empowering, one that is Rescuing, saving, attending, edifying, teaching, building, advocating for you, as in Job 33. There are also evil angels who are tempting, seducing, who have a deceptive message. Now you contrast that with spirits and you can see that there are different aspects that God is trying to teach you in using the Hebrew word of ruach and the Greek word of angelos, messenger. We also have this understanding of spirit as breath or one that gives life, something that gives life. And so we understand that the spirit of God is what gives life. We also understand that the spirit of the devil is what brings death. And so you have to choose which spirit you're going to fan into. Which messenger are you listening to? Which angelos are you listening to? Psalm 106.33 says, Because they provoked his spirit so that he spake 
unadvisedly with his lips. So there can also be a provocation of spirit, right? They're, you're provoking certain feelings or reaction reactions and character that's coming out from whatever spirit is occupying a person. In Psalm 135, 17, it's when talking about false gods and idols, he says they have ears, but they hear not. Neither is there any breath in their mouths, any life in their mouths. And so if you think about this, you know, starting from Psalms, all, going all the way to the New Testament, where we talk about the concept of life and death, and even setting up idols that we think are alive, that we regard as being alive simply because they speak and carnally they're alive, but spiritually they're dead. So placing, let's go back to this idea of placing some politician up as a God. Just because they can hear certain things in the carnal doesn't mean they hear. Just because they can see certain things doesn't mean they see. And just because there's breath in their mouths does not mean that they are alive. So now we have this concept that has been established, but has been fulfilled. It hasn't been disregarded. It's not, we're not throwing it away. We're understanding that God has established ears to hear, eyes to see, a breath to evidence life in a person. And you're supposed to understand in the New Testament that the fulfillment of that means that if you see that this person is bearing the fruit of being able to hear the things of God, see the things of God, understand with their heart, then you know what's in their heart and you test the spirit in their mouths. You test the spirit that is operating inside of them. And that's going to tell you whether someone is dead or alive. You want to vote for someone who's dead? You want to vote for the important people of the world? Place your hope in them. Follow their shameful example of promoting counterfeit Christianity. Goofballs standing up on stage calling spirits out of Argentina and Africa, claiming to speak in tongues they don't even have the sense to understand that tongues are languages, not shunda boko babble. If you can't see that fruit, if you can't test that spirit, you too are dead. The prophet is guilty and so is the one who consults them. Return to God. He's your king. We were not supposed to want a human king. We have been punished. We have been under judgment for wanting a human king. Now I'm going to fast forward because I want to see what has been spoken of with regard to spirit, ruach, later in the Bible. And what I'm noticing is that this word is not actually even seen later on in the New Testament, this particular word. So we're going to look up spirit in the New Testament. Okay, what I see in Ezekiel is that there's no breath in those bones, the valley of dry bones. That's what's being spoken of here. And until there is spirit in them, until there is breath breathed into them, there's no life. It's the same with us. I mean, we can literally be breathing and opening our eyes, batting our eyelashes. We can look like we're alive, but until that spirit is breathed into us, we're dead. We are a valley of dry bones. Hosea 4.12, my people ask counsel at their stocks and their staff declareth unto them for the spirit of whoredoms hath caused them to err and they have gone a whoring from under their God. Okay, a spirit of prostitution, that's what he's talking about. That is associated with a spirit, your sins are associated with a spirit. When you keep sinning, you have invited that spirit in to occupy you. And not only is that spirit, that spirit isn't just with you while you're committing that sin. That spirit is compelling you and attacking you. And this is, I, I don't think you can see that any more clearly than in addiction. People doing the very things that they don't want to do that are destroying their lives, but they just can't live without it. They know it's going to kill them. They know it's going to destroy their families. They know that it's hurting their children. They know that it could kill their children and they cannot stop doing it. They are being compelled by an evil spirit because that is what they've chosen. And what does God say? He says, return to me and I will heal you. If you return to him, you'll be free of it. Not counseling, not therapy, not screaming spirits out. You need to return to him, humble yourself, examine yourself and change. When you engage in that repentance, that spirit will no longer occupy you. People don't understand how to heal because they don't believe in his word. So you hear in this passage that that spirit of whoredoms, that spirit of prostitution, hath caused them to err. So it has taken over their life. That subtle enticement to do something, to go to the world for one thing. When you keep choosing that, that spirit is going to occupy you and it's going to want more and more, and it's going to connect with other spirits, and the final condition of that person is going to be worse than it was in the beginning. That's what Jesus said. In Habakkuk 1.11, it says, 
then shall his mind change and he shall pass over and offend imputing this his power unto his God. So that's also something that a spirit will do. If you're fanning into flame God's Holy Spirit, eventually you're going to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If you are fanning into another spirit by choosing your flesh and sin, then what is going to happen is that your mind is going to change according to that spirit. Conformity, alignment. These words need to be in your repertoire. You need to understand that what you choose, you will conform to because you don't belong to yourself. That will be the thing that rules over you. Your mind will change. Your personality will change. Circumstances will change. Your heart will change. You will be filled with a spirit of fear if you choose the enemy. And though you will receive rewards in this life, it will never bring you peace because the only place that you can find peace is in God's spirit. Again, in Haggai 114, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah. He's stirring up the spirit of Zerubbabel, which is the spirit of Christ. Zerubbabel is being used uh, symbolically for Christ. He's stirring up their spirit in order to build the temple of God, in order to come and work on the house of God. I'm sorry. I think I said something else. Did I say Habakkuk or Hosea or something? This is in Haggai. So that spirit of Zerubbabel is that is being represented as Christ. We see that again in, in Zechariah. So he can stir up good spirits and he can stir up bad spirits. And here, of course, he's stirring up a good spirit and he's saying, my spirit remains among you, so do not fear. Again, Zechariah 4, this is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel saying, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And here in Malachi 2.16, For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away, for one, cov one covereth, covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously. So have a conscience, be true in your spirit, have integrity. Okay, now in the New Testament, there's this context of pneuma, which is also the word spirit. It stands for Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit. And uh, by the way, it's G4151. Then there's also this context in Matthew 5, 3, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So this is an attitude. It's not even necessarily what's in your bank account. Poor in spirit means that you have an attitude in your spirit. This is how you feel. This is how you live your life. You don't live your life in a worldly way. Oh, I have the money. Therefore, why don't I just buy it? Oh, I'm feeling down today. I need a shopping trip. I mean, I lived this way for many, many years, buying things just to buy them. Like I needed stuff. Matthew 8, 16. Now we have a new context. When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils and he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. Okay, so what is causing their sickness? Is there a change today? Something different going on now? Since God supposedly gave us science? No, that's been given to you as a stumbling block. You can see right here that they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils and he cast out the spirits. They were possessed with devils and he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Matthew 12, 43, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest and finding none. So this is the context I was giving you earlier. Let's read it. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept and garnished. This is because this person has not returned to God. They have not repented. Remember that Jesus said, to repent after he healed people. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of the man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be unto this wicked generation. No one seems to be able to hear that. Very, very few can even hear that message. Then remember that Jesus says, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit is indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So he's talking about the spirit that God has given you, not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit hadn't been given yet. He's talking about the spirit that is in you, that comes from heaven. And there was in their synagogue, a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out saying, let us alone. What have we to do with thee? Thou Jesus of Nazareth, art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him saying, hold thy peace and come out of him. Okay, so as I told you before, spirits can know certain things. 
It does not mean that you go and submit to them because you want some knowledge, but that's what people are doing when they're going to a psychic. What they want is to have knowledge. They have turned their face from God. They don't care about what God wants them to know or they would go to him. They want to hear so that they can control, so that they can have power by the work of their own hands. It's a delusion. It's a fantasy. You are turning to a spirit that has no loyalty to you. And when the spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed in so much that they questioned among themselves saying, what thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the young clean spirits and they obey, they do obey him. In Mark 2, 8, it says, and immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, why reason ye th these things in your hearts? Okay, so in his spirit is where he's discerning. And that's where you need to discern, not by your carnality. You don't read these magazines and studies that say, oh, 10 ways to know if such and such. That is people, th th this is people's attempt to control by the work of their own hands and by their own wisdom. They're going to figure someone out. They're going to have 10 signs that someone is a narcissist. That's not what the word says. The word says discern the fruit and test the spirit. You do this in the spirit, not by your carnal mind. And unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. You see this? Those spirits submit to God. And they came over unto the side, the other side of the, of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Because that he had often been bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken pieces, neither could any man tame him, tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him, and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God, that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much, that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding, and all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. So you see that these spirits know who Jesus is. Now let me ask you something. Do you think that they know who he is in you? When you start living in the authority that God has given you and you start receiving gifts, they're going to know you. They're going to recognize you. Now, I want to remind you that in Acts 19, verse 15, there were seven sons of Sceva who were doing works in the name of Jesus. And one day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I know. It's not just Jesus. Paul I know, but who are you? How did they know Paul? They knew Paul because of the anointing, because of that gift. So those spirits are going to start reacting to you. And when they react to you, because you see that they can't contain themselves, they can't keep themselves together. I'm telling you, I can see this rise up in people when I'm working with them. I can see that spirit start reacting to me or not to me, but to God in me. So one of this, the evil spirits answered, Jesus, I know. And Paul, I know, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. They know God's people. You need to know that. They will react to you. Just as you see repeatedly here that they are reacting to Jesus. But you need to stand firm in that authority and what it is that you're doing. Because if you start to become scared of them, you start to just try to take this for yourself. You're going to get a beating. What stopped them from turning around and saying, no, come out. And don't say that they were using their anointing incorrectly. That's not true. That's not correct. God does not anoint people to use the anointing incorrectly. He's teaching them. And remember what Jesus said to the disciples when they couldn't drive out a spirit. He said, it's because you're having, you have little faith. You need to fan in your faith. That's where you need to work. Okay. I think we have a good idea of what's going on here. What I want, the reason why we've been studying this and wanting to understand more and more about who Satan is, what is he, what is, what is he all about? What is the extent of his power? The extent of his power is what you give him permission to do through your sin or what God gives him permission to do in order to test and build. When you repent and you acknowledge what you've done, you need to be prepared that you're going to be tested. You have to know that. You have to know that testing is coming down the pike and that if you don't pass that test, you haven't repented. 
that is the test to see if you have repented. He's going to put you in this situation that caused you to sin to begin with. He's going to stir up those feelings in you that caused you to sin to begin with in order to test to see if you're going to resist. God is using Satan. He is using him for his own purposes. You have to understand that. And you have to remember that in those moments, you got to turn to God. Every time you turn to God, you recognize what's going on, what the schemes of the devil are, and then you turn to God. The schemes of the devil are not going to change. They're always going to be evil. And so you have to recognize that all evil is coming from Satan. And that when God is done using evil in order to test you, evil and Satan will be thrown into the lake of burning sulfur. Death, Hades, and Satan will be thrown into the lake of burning sulfur and all those who have chosen them. The only reason Satan remains when at, at the time of the resurrection is in order to execute, turn on his own people, to execute punishment on Babylon and all the people who've chosen her after the resurrection takes place. Then when the battle of Armageddon takes place, when, when the, the wedding supper of the lamb has, has occurred and God comes back with his holy ones, Jesus comes back with his bride, he will slay everyone with the double-edged sword coming out of his mouth. He's going to be slain by conviction. Satan is going to be bound for a thousand years, not thrown into the lake of burning sulfur yet. All those who receive the mark of the beast, thrown into the lake of burning sulfur. The false prophet, thrown into the lake of burning sulfur. The rest of the dead will come to life after the thousand years have ended, and Satan will be unbound in order to deceive again. Because that testing is happening. So you see that God is, he, he's walking him along on a, on a string. Go this way, go that way. Then he turns on him. Once he's fulfilled what God is doing through him, then he's going to turn against him and Satan will go to destruction. So after that thousand, after that thousand years have ended and the second resurrection takes place and all hearts have been tested, there will be some who are going to be saved, even as one escaping the flames. They won't have a reward. They won't have an inheritance. They are not the bride of Christ. They are not sons of God, but they are servants of God, and they will be saved. God's done using the devil. Now the devil will go into the lake of burning sulfur. Now, I want to tell you what God's attitude is towards Satan. I want to, I want to demonstrate this for you. Job 41. Can you pull in Leviathan with a fish hook or tie down its tongue with a rope? Can you put a cord through its nose or pierce its jaw with a hook? Will you keep it begging you for mercy? Will it speak to you with gentle words? Will it make an agreement with you for you to take it as a slave for life? Can you make a pet of it like a bird or put it on a leash for the young women in your house? Will traders barter, barter for it? Will they divide it up among the merchants? Can you fill its hide with harpoons or its head with fishing spears? If you lay a hand on it, you will remember the struggle and never do it again. Okay, so this is what God does. And I always, I always think of verse 5. How he says, can you make a pet of it like a bird or put it on a leash for the young women in your house? He's nothing. Satan is nothing. Listen to what he says in Isaiah. But you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. Those who see you stare at you. They ponder your fate. Is this the man who shook the earth and made the kingdoms tremble? The man who made the world a wilderness, who overthrew its cities and would not let its captives go home? All the kings of the, la the nations lie in state, each in his own tomb. But you are cast out of your tomb like a rejected branch. You are covered with the slain, with those pierced by the sword, those who descend to the stones of the pit, like a corpse trampled underfoot. You will not join them in burial, for you have destroyed your land and killed your people. That is God's attitude towards Satan. He's been upon this entire time to test your hearts to see if what you're going to do. So... It's ridiculous that we keep in counterfeit Christianity, that they keep acting like he has so much power, having the appearance of godliness, but they deny the power of God. They act like Satan's got more power, being so afraid of what it is that he can do to them, the extent that they would disobey God in favor of what man has established here and what man tries to coerce you to do. We're living in a time where we are coerced and forced to do things that we are not supposed to do. Send our children to public school? Why? Why would I have somebody else teach my child? And, and of course I did, like an idiot. I sent my daughter to school, but now I think about it and I'm like, why would you ever hand your child the most precious responsibility? Hand that over to some deranged person. You don't even know who these people are. Most of them are deranged. You can see it right now, how deranged they are. Hand them over to a perfect stranger and have them teach them all day. And then you submit yourself to that perfect stranger and punish your kid because they didn't get 
such and such grade, they didn't do their homework, they didn't, you know, accommodate to the world correctly. No, God's people don't submit to that. You gotta go make your child a guinea pig, make yourself a guinea pig, your animals a gu guinea pig to the field of medicine that denies that there's a creator. You gotta receive the mark of the beast too. Why? Because you're scared of what man has established here. And now you're going to enter systems where they're going to tell you this, these are the standards. This is how you must live. You will imprison yourself. There are people getting their children taken away. There's a lady on the news right now who was submitting to medicine, brought her little baby, her, her I don't know, he was probably about a year old. She brought her child to a hospital. They wanted to, for some sort of a rash, they wanted to, uh, to give a, a medication that had a black box label warning. And she said, you know, I'm not really comfortable with that medication. And they were insisting on it. And so she left the hospital AMA. This is a person who would have taken him to a different hospital. I, I personally, that is, you know, that's not my position. But because she submitted herself to them and her child placed him on that altar and then snatched him up and said, oh, never mind. They took her child away. You leave that door open, then they're going to start dictating. Satan is going to start dictating what you need to do with your children. They took her child away. She has been apart from her child for months at an age that she will never get back. She will never get that back and neither will her son. A couple, not that long ago, went to some hospital, I think in Houston. The doctors decapitated the baby during the birth process, separated the baby's head. And because the parents wanted to see the baby, they wrapped the baby up, a dead baby, and had them see the baby through a window and tried to bully them into doing an immediate cremation of the baby. This is what you want to submit your kids to. This is the field that Christ gave you. That, that's the field he gave you. God gave us science. Science denies the existence of a creator. There is no such thing as a Christian practitioner in the field of science. There isn't. That is the authority on which they speak. Anyone calling themselves Christian in those disciplines is a prostitute. You heard in the Bible where these things came from. You heard from Jesus himself that this is the condition of this wicked generation. Spirit possession. Satan is the one tormenting. He's the one torturing. He's the one harassing and oppressing. But even Satan has to submit to God. Please discern this message with God.